today we are talking about how to use stored items in a thermal cooker and how to how to cook with that and some thought process some thought processes behind it um, and little tricks and tips to help you think through the process of how to use them because the reality is is things that are stored like grains and beans and um uh, freeze dried and dehydrated foods, they love the thermal cooker. Okay. I thought of one thing that didn't, that you store that you really don't, that doesn't love it. And that's pasta. And we're going to talk about that. But for the most part, things that we store, they absolutely love the thermal cooker. So, um, it's a great segue. I mean, it's a great thing to talk about because really the niche in thermal cooking, um, it has always been preparedness, right? I use it for lots of things, but People seem to think that the best thing for thermal cooking is, you know, the preparedness minded people can see the value of thermal cooking, right? Preparedness minded and low resource settings. They're the ones that seem to really get it. Okay. Um, a couple of things before I um, really get started in the presentation that I want to mention, because I don't know if I'm going to have them in the bulk of the presentation. I have, you know, the one that gets recorded forever. I don't know. So I have several classes. I'm not sure for sure which date next month, um, but for sure this class will be at the beginning of the month, virtual class. I don't know the subject yet. So if you have some ideas, put it in the chat or send me an email and um, we'll pick one of what the subject will be. But it's at the beginning of the month because I, my son's getting married on the 25th. So I'm going to try and have everything done the first half of the month. And um, this next one is coming up, I think on the 21st, and it's something different that I haven't done before. And uh, well, I can't say that. I used to do this kind of thing all the time. I would like make tons of food and have like detailed information on all the things like the grains. In fact, I'll show you this. You see all these grains, see those? <laughs> so these, when I used to teach grain classes, see, it was a game. So when people came, they would like guess what was in these. So I don't even know that I could tell you right now what all of these are. This looks like a uh, Kamut, right? And this one is definitely oatmeal, rolled oats. And so when to start the class, I just give them a piece of paper and then look on here and guess and see how many grains they had. So then we'll talk about all the, um, the nutritional value and I have recipes and, and be quiet because I know that's loud for you guys. So I would have recipes uh, made out of them and uh, so everybody could try a bunch of food. So that's what I'm going to do on the 21st. It's going to be again, the stored items and we're going to have, um, I'll have a lot of food. It's I think it's $40 for the class. I can't remember. You'll have to look, go into the event and see. But um, it's just an evening of lots of really good information on, on what to do with the different grains and the stored items. And then we're just going to have a lot of food. I'm going to show, I'm going to have a lot pre-made in the thermal cooker. And then if there's things, and we'll, we'll demo some things in the thermal cooker. And then um, we'll just eat a lot of food. <laughs> because thermal cookers make a lot of food. So we'll just eat it. So anybody that's in the area and wants to come, I'm going to do this one at my house and um, we're just going to have a nice night and have fun doing that. And I think that's on the 21st of April. And then um, on the 28th of April, for those in the area, I'm having a sew-a-thon. Uh, we're going to be, um, for anybody that wants to make a hope sack themselves, they can come and do that. It's $30 to make it. And I will bring the, the insulation for you. So you get the, the pattern and the insulation. Um, and I will pre-send the uh, documentation and, and all the, I'll actually pre-send you the pattern. And then you can buy the stuff that you need. And I'll send in, you know, instructions on what to do. So you know exactly what you're doing. And then when you come, you don't have to worry about buying the the, the phone, because I will have that there for you. And you can just come and make your own. All right. And then the other part, if you just want to come and help, we're going to be making things to send to Kenya. We're going to be making hope sacks. And I think I'll have a section doing the garden towers. Oh, the garden towers. I was going to show you one of them. Anyway, I left them out in the garage. I'll be thinking of that. I might have to run out before the end and show you the garden tower. Anyway, because we're going to make those two to get um, those organized and for a project that we're working on. So 
And then, like I said, the first of next month, that class, the in-person class, I'm looking for some, there's going to be an in-person class and I'm looking for, to see if someone would like to host that. And then I have a thon on the 11th of May and another one on the 19th of May. Okay. I think I got all that stuff done. Okay. Okay. The next thing I want to tell you is see, I wore my bracelets today. These are all my Kenya bracelets. These are my, this is my Hope Sack one, my Isupa. That's my name in Maasai. And this is my Cindy bracelet. And I, these are just, you know, Maasai are really known for their beads and my earrings. So I want to remind myself that I want to tell you something that's super exciting um, that we're going to be, I mean, that we're doing. And Heidi and I, my friend Heidi Totten that runs 100 Humanitarians, we are going to Kenya in June. And so the plan is, is to send some hope sacks ahead, as many as I can get made and prepared. And, and then so with a group, there's a group going right ahead of us <clears throat> with 100 humanitarians and they're doing the expedition. And then we're gonna meet over there. We're gonna head over there and um, go to, um, go from one of our north, farthest north locations that we have got people in and we're heading north and we're gonna open several new areas and we're gonna be, um, just doing some research. This is just us two with a couple guides that are our safari guides, the people that we know. We're not going on safari this time. We're there to work and we're gonna open some new areas and we're gonna do sewing instruction and teach people how to do both the gardening with the garden towers and you how to use the hope sacks. So they'll be able to know how to make them and we're gonna set them up in the ones that have sewing centers. We're gonna teach them how to actually sew them. And then the ones that don't, we're going to take as many hope sacks as we can over. And so that's what I'm working on. So I have a couple of programs of sew thons where people come. We also have where people can make them in their houses and just cut. Do, they'll do just like the pillow piece, right? And then they'll send them over and um, send them back. And then I, I put them all together. Anyway, so that's coming up in June. And that's coming up fast because it's two weeks. I leave two weeks from or two months from tomorrow. I fly out on the 8th of June. So June, I don't know if we're going <laughs> to, virtual class might be from Kenya, actually, maybe. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Other, anyway, get on my Let's Make Sense of Thermal Cooking or my Facebook page. By the way, if you guys, I have like, I realized yesterday, I have 450 friend requests that I have not responded to because I'm not sure who the people are. So if you... If, we're, if I haven't responded to a friend request, would you just send me a message and let me know that it's somebody for thermal cooking? Because there's so many that I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. So I want to, I don't know, a couple of them from yesterday were scammers. So I'm like, let's just, you guys, I want to be your friend on Facebook. And that's where I'll post a lot of things is on my Cindy McMullen Miller Facebook page. As far as while I'm on the trip, that's the first place it goes. And then when I get home, I probably will share it to the other places. But if you want to see what I'm doing every single day when I'm in Kenya, that's where you find me to do that. All right, let's go to work. It is time to go. And I think we have the people on that are going to be on. We have 23 on right now. So that's awesome. Welcome, welcome. And let's just get into the PowerPoint because that's going to help me know what I'm talking about. That looks like Kamut in that picture. Can everybody see it now? I hope. All right. So stored foods and the thermal cooker. My website, thermalcooking.net. You can subscribe to my newsletter there. You scroll all the way to the bottom and on each page and you can get on the newsletter. And I do them, I'm trying to do them once a month, but you all know that I struggle with that. So you might get, my goal is to, to send one out every month, but right now it's about every other month. Uh, Cindy at thermalcooking.net. If you have want to email me, that's great. Also, I have a uh, sign up for thermal cooking Thursday and, and I'm working on that. It's going to be like a little bit of information, not a ton, like a reel or a story or something to do or a how to do this in thermal cooking and it will be automated. So it'll just be a simple email that comes and my goal is to get it all set up for Thursdays and only take a couple minutes to go through, but hopefully it's a, a nice information of um, just something thermal cooking wise. The newsletter will definitely be one of the weeks. Um, I'm trying to do most of my classes or a lot of them on Thursday, but if it's an in-person class or somebody has a request, I'll definitely do them another day. All these classes that I'm doing, um, I'm making the PowerPoints too, and they can be a live class. So you have a group that you want me to come to and teach. 
because that is what I do. I go to people's places and teach. And you say, you know what? I really like that bread class. Could you come and teach my class, my group that bread class? Um, most of the time, I just do the basic thermal cooking class when I do a live class. But like this next one, like I mentioned, is going to be the stored one class. The Let's Make Sense of Thermal Cooking. You can find people are always like, how do I find you places? Let's Make Sense of Thermal Cooking. That's how you find me on YouTube and Facebook. There's a page and a group on Facebook called Let's Make Sense of Thermal Cooking. On Pinterest and Etsy is a thermal cooking show or thermal cooking show. All right. All right. I have this package for the people that are on my shows, all three of my courses, and I'm not going to go over those today at all in the presentation, um, but it's the live, the cookbook digital, the 12 lesson course, and all these videos are going to be in that course once they're archived, and then the video pattern course, all of them, um, and they're on the front page of my website, you just scroll down and it says uh, ultimate combo. And that's where you find it. And somebody just asked me yesterday, actually maybe two people, where do I get that special that you talk about in your classes? This is where you get it is on the front page of my website at thermalcooking.net. All right. In 2015, I published my book. Okay. Here it is right here. When I did that, and I started writing my book in 2012, when I first learned about a thermal cooker and I wanted to figure out all the little ins and outs of how to do it. Um, and it took me three years to write, not because it was so hard to write a, but it was hard to write a book. Let's be serious. But, you know, I was just getting my mind around it, but, you know, having kids, raising teenagers, um, all that just came into play. I had a son get married while I was doing it. And so, you know, it just got set on the side for a while. And so it took me three years to get it done. But as I was trying to figure out how and what, what order I wanted to write this book in, I just knew it needed to be um, sort of follow along um, food storage. So that's what this book does. It, the first section is just basics. And the next one is freeze dried and dehydrated meals. There's 11 recipes in there with freeze dried and dehydrated meals. And not only are they freeze dried and dehydrated, but they're also with fresh ingredients too. So you get both kind of recipes um, because freeze dried and dehydrated meals are long-term food storage. And the next section I did, I called bucket meals. And they're like taking the 90 day food storage, like your canned items, um, things that you don't, that don't have as long of a shelf life. They'll last more than 90 days, but um, you know, it's just the thought of things that don't last as long as something that might last 20 years, right? So, so that was the next section. And then the last one were fresh ingredients and how to use them in the thermal cooker. And then I went into um, grains, beans, um, which both love the thermal cooker and then pasta and fresh ingredients that don't like it quite so much. And then we did breads and desserts and like beverages and miscellaneous things that you can use the thermal cooker for. And so it's all a preparedness book is what it is. It's based on food storage and preparedness and how, and then also how to use it in your everyday lives. But the heavy part is really about how to use your food storage. So it just seemed like it made sense to teach this class about food storage. Um, I think I'm down to under 500 books left, the hard copies, and then I need to print again. And I honestly don't know when that's going to happen. Um, we sell on Amazon books every day right now and from my house. Um, because I sell them from here. My, they're cheaper on the website. Um, they're $25 on the website. I can't remember they are on Amazon, but they are free shipping on Amazon if you have Amazon Prime. So that's maybe, you know, when people go into Amazon, they can at least find them. And we are, they're, peop, they're selling right now. I think we sent in two, two cases a month and a half ago and there, I think we have like five left. So they're selling, I mean, you can see how it's perked up, right? The interest in thermal cooking has just skyrocketed in the last year. I wonder why. Anyway, that was a joke. Is everybody laughing? Just kidding. So let's go over super, super simple basic as far as thermal cooking. Most of you guys know this um, that have been on my class before, but you boil the food. You have to boil the food. You have to insulate it. You're going to put an insulator around it once it's it's boiled and it's going to trap that heat you created from boiling the food 
and then you're just going to wait. And the reason I want to go through this first is because everything we're going to talk about next, before I get into the details of the class or the details of how thermal cooking works, this is what we're going to do with it. We're going to bring these items to a boil and we're going to put them in an insulator and then we're just going to wait. Okay. For those of you that knew or knew, I just want you to understand that's the basic technique of how to do thermal cooking or retain heat cooking. In fact, insulated cooking might be the best name for this. I don't know. I'm calling it so many different names because I don't quite know what sticks and what makes sense. Because some people like thermal cooking. That's like, you, you, it's just heat cooking. Yeah, thermal cooking is just heat cooking. Insulated cooking is actually more of a proper name for it, I think. Um, so here's some pictures of stored items, right? We've got um, grains, beans. So we're going to talk about stored items, um, rice, grains, legumes, freeze dried and dehydrated. We're going to talk about all of these today. So when you're cooking whole grains, there's a couple tips that I wanted to share. So we're going to start with whole grains. So that's not oatmeal because oatmeal, um, it's, it's flaked, right? These are whole grains. So when you're cooking a whole grain, um, you think about a whole grain and it's got a nice, I don't know, you can see some of, I don't know, which ones can we see on here that are whole grain? It looks like up in the corner, there's a whole grain. I don't even know what that is. Something, it might be a, I don't even know. We're not gonna look at that picture. So whole grains, I have some here. Here's my Kamut that I just showed. No, that's not Kamut. This looks like oat groats. So we know that they have a heavy, um, like a thicker skin on them if they're not cut. So it's gonna take a longer time to heat through and get these to cook. But whole grains are super, super, super easy to do in the thermal cooker. And at first, let's go off of this for a sec. Cause you know, I'm gonna talk for a second, you know, I need to read all that. So at first when I was doing retained heat cooking, I, I, um, I thought that I needed to like figure out every single grain and the amount of time exactly it needed to cook, right? But this is the beauty of a whole grain. You just bring it to a boil. It doesn't matter how much water you have in it because you're gonna strain off the water anyway. So even in my book last night, as I was reading through and getting refreshing my memory on the things that I had written about grains, it says, you know, you're just gonna add eight cups of water. And then I have a whole different part that says, but since it's a whole grain, it's more about thermal mass, right? Technically, if you were fixing it in a pan, you do like add eight cups of water to whatever the amount of grain was. But with retained heat cooking, all I would do is, um, is put these in and bring it to a boil. Um, but the amount of water, it doesn't matter because in the end, I'm just going to strain off the water anyway because the wheat berries or the... Um, or the oat groats or whatever they are, they don't, it's not like rice, right? You're just gonna strain off the water. So it's more about thermal mass. We'll teach about thermal mass at the end of the class or later in the class, but it's about the volume that's in there to retain the heat and keep the food hot so it finishes cooking. The thing about grains is they're gonna cook. It's not gonna be a problem. Grains aren't too thick. Beans. They're a little bit harder to cook, but grains are super easy to cook. You're just going to put your grain in the pot, put the water in, some salt, bring it to a boil, let it boil for a minute or two minutes, put it in the thermal cooker, because once it's boiled, it's going to be enough heat to finish cooking that grain, especially if you're leaving in there for an extended amount of time. And it'll just stay in there. A, a, a whole grain berry or berry will stay in there for a long time in the thermal cooker without having a lot of problems. So let's look at what I had in the shared thing. Make sure that we talked about the things. So number one tip is that the whole grains to create extra. Okay. So this is a tip for, for, um, to utilize last week, I had somebody in, on YouTube comment, like you're using so much water to make the bread. Well, you're not really using that much water around. It's maybe two quarts of water, but I get their point. What are you going to do with that water? And I just said, well, utilize the water for something else, especially if it's an emergency. So she's worried about the water on the outside of the container to make the bread. And I'm like, hey, that's hot water. When you open it up, can you use it to wash your dishes or something if we're in an emergency situation? So I understand that. But when it comes to thermal mass and thermal cooking, 
Um, sometimes you only have, you only want to fill the bottom of the pot. Let me get a pot out. Okay. Let me go back off of this so I can explain this concept. I'm sure you love it when I come up close. Boiling and drain. Yes. Okay. We're going to talk about rice. The question is boiling and draining doesn't apply to rice. Correct. This is only the other grains. Okay. I have a whole section just on rice. We're going to talk about that next. But these are the other kind of grains. The whole berries is what we're talking about right now. Okay. So let's say for dinner, I have something that I'm making in the bottom of this. Maybe Mexican fiesta. I don't know. Meal. I don't know. It's one that we used to make all the time when I was doing classes. And um, the recipe is in the Saratoga Jack's little pamphlet that they have in their thing. And uh, it's just a chicken and rice meal. Actually, that one doesn't count because that one has rice on top. Let's just say we're making something in the bottom, okay? And I don't want to make a whole bunch of food to fill it all the way 75 to 80% full because we're never going to eat that, right? But I love to have, like, I'd like to make a grain salad on in two days. Um, you know, they have those, like, that quinoa one. What is that one with? I don't know. You can find lots of grain salads with the base or, gra or grains or just like you like to put cooked grains on in some kind of other meal or on top of a salad or whatever. So, but to make extra thermal mass, what you could do is cook your grain in the other pot. So you bring your food to a boil in this one, your grain to a boil in this one with water. And like I said, it's not mattering how much water, just enough for that amount of grain. You want at least the amount that it needs for that one. You can just Google this grain, how much water do you usually cook with it? And so, um, and so what you'll do is boil in this one, put it in here, and now you've created the thermal mass because you have both pots in here. And then that, that this can stay in here for a long time and stay hot for a long time. Does that make sense? Just pre-cook some of your foods. I used to teach that principle all the time um, when I was teaching my classes, especially at the beginning, because uh, people were always like, how do you cook for less people? Well, utilize the space cooking something to prep for another meal. Um, the thing that um, has happened is I focused on over the years to really try and find other ways to cook for less people, like cooking for two, right? And so with container cooking, we've sort of figured out how to do that. And so um, I don't necessarily, I've forgotten all about that little sort of tip until I was researching for this lesson. And it is a good one because you can then put, strain the grain off, put it in your fridge, and then you can pull it out for that healthy boost of nutrition um, for other meals, right? Uh, in fact, the food I made this morning to open, we'll see, it's gonna be more than I can eat. So I will talk about some ideas of what I can do with the extra later. Okay, let's see what our next tip was. All right. Okay. So follow general guidelines for specific grain when deciding how much water to use, right? That's like what the, the main thing is. But then in parentheses, I said, but any extra, right, is fine to strain it. So it doesn't matter. It's about thermal mass to make sure that cooker is efficient. Uh, okay, this is a thing that would happen. And most of the time, this is probably should be with grain. I mean, not grain, but rice because rice you want a little more even. And most of the time when I'm doing whole groats or whole berries, um, I have plenty of extra water in there. And so I just strain off the water. But if I don't, and sometimes I'll open um, the pot. Okay. So a lot of times I'm cooking my grains in the top one, right? my rice or my grain in the top pot. And I've got something else going in the bottom pot. So sometimes I'll have the grain and maybe it'll seem like a little dry here and there'll be moisture on the bottom part, right? And that's because once you take this off the stove, the boiling is not rotating the grain and not keeping that heat moving as well as it could if it was boiling, right? And so even though the top are pretty well cooked, sometimes they might not seem 
like it, especially with brown rice. This is, so I said, I should probably be talking about this with rice, rice, but just remember it when we get to rice, because it's, this applies to whole grains too. If the water, you don't have as much water in there. So the bottom part has a little more water still in it. And the top part might be a little dry, but they're almost all, they're probably cooked or really close to it. I just open this up, stir it up, right? Try and bring the bottom to the top a little bit and stick it back in there for a little bit, maybe 10 minutes, just while I'm doing something else before dinner and then pull it out. It's made it so that now that moisture has, has gone through all of it. It had just, it's moistened up those ones that were on the top that are now on the bottom and then it's ready to eat. I get it that when we're not using a thermal cooker, it might cook a little different, but the point is you're able to cook it and use this by and save heat. So there are sometimes in thermal cooking things that you have to adapt a little bit that you're not used to. And sometimes I found that with grains and brown rice, okay, with this type of a situation. It's just something, as long as you know the information, you can adapt it, super simple. Instead of open it and going, oh no, you know, it's it doesn't look like it's quite done or whatever, but the bottom ones are mushy. Well, now you know what to do. They're not, not mushy, but they're wetter, right? Just rotate that around, stick it back in the thermal cooker, let it sit for 10 minutes or so, and it should just pull up that moisture because it's already almost there. Does that make sense? You're just trying to spread out and make it more even texture all the way through. Okay. Anyway, I haven't had that happen for years. I had totally forgot about that piece. So, but you might find it as you cook grain. So I wanted to make sure and cover that. Breads, okay, breads are something, obviously, this is what you're gonna do with grain. You're gonna make bread. All these grains can be ground up and used in bread. Some of them, I sure wouldn't look, use very much, like amaranth, man, that stuff is strong. I'm not adding very much <laughs> to any kind of bread, but that's the beauty of grains is that you can grind them up and then you can make bread. So that's definitely something I wanted to cover in, um, this class is because it's something we use with our brand, our breads. Um, the other thing real quick that I would make sure that you understand and have a knowledge of with bread, with grains is know how to sprout them. In an emergency situation, sprouting your grain is going to magnify the um, nutrition in that grain, like 600 or 700 fold in some cases. So sprouting is such a um, important knowledge to have, especially in an emergency situation so that you get nutrients you need and, and make sure that when you're storing some of those grains that you know that you're not going to kill the grain and you're going to be able to sprout it because some methods of storing will make it so that you're not able to sprout that grain and other ones you can. So just do a little research on that at the top of my head. I don't remember all the details on that, but make sure you know how to sprout as far as preparedness. Okay. And that's something that's done with stored grains. So let's move on because I don't have anything to the thermocooker. Let's move to the breads because it does. So here is, there's some different breads here. And this is, I'm just going to quickly go through how to make bread in a thermal cooker. So you're going to make your dough and you're going to take the dough ball that's going to fit in the right size of your container. Okay, and what you want to do is you want to have it about a third of the size of the container. If your dough, um, like the last month when I made the bread, for those of you who were here, um, I, I bought it. I bought it from Winco because they sell dough at Winco and I didn't have enough time and I didn't have my machine here. So I, I just went and bought it. But the thing is, is when you have bread and you make it yourself, you know, that feeling of bread and, and how warm it is and it really moves well. When you're at, when it's at that state is when it's going to be work just perfectly in a thermal cooker. Okay. And that means that you don't have to have it rise. One thing I noticed for those of you, I'll update you on last, last month's bread because the one that I opened was beautiful. Right. But what I realized is the one that I opened later. So the one I opened in class was beautiful and it tasted great. They loved it at my St. Patrick's day party and they ate it all. I didn't have anything to bring home because everybody ate the bread. Um, it was an herbed bread that I turned green so that it was or green things going through it so that it was St. Patrick's day. But the one I opened up when I got later, um, remember the day I was out talking to my neighbor 
and I didn't know how long it was in there. I could have left it in longer for one thing, but I think the biggest issue was that the bread didn't have that nice warm feeling. Although it was, there were bubbles in it, like I could see the bubbles in it, it needed another rise if I needed, if I was gonna use it in that state. Um, but if I'm just pulling it out of my bread mixer, it's already warm, you've added the warm water to activate the yeast. And then you just go ahead and put a third of the size of the ball into your pot. And then you put the cover on it, let it rise as it's coming to a boil. That works really well that way. But if your dough is a little cold still, I would suggest putting it in the pot, in the container, letting it rise so you can tell it's starting to rise, maybe not all the way, but maybe another third of the way risen, and then put it in the pot with the water around it and bring it to a boil, okay? That is one of the things I noticed about um, last week. The other thing was also the one that I did the herb bread and I added um, the Parmesan cheese to, it needed a longer boil because of the moisture that the cheese added to it. It was sort of like when I do the sweet bread and I always add five to 10 minutes more boil, I should have done that with that bread with the Parmesan cheese in it. And, but boy, it tasted delicious. It was so, so good, but it didn't, um, it didn't work right with that piece. All right. So, and then the other thing you can see on the third picture here, there's um, a, a, the, I use the trivet and I use the trivet. So there's water on the bottom, water up the sides. So when it just creates more thermal mass. All right. And you want to make sure that happens if the pot is too short. You're good. My roommate came back. Welcome. All right. All right. So you can see that the um, in this one, you've got the dough inside there. That is a tin can. That's an old picture of mine. When I started making bread, I literally used like a peanut tin can, a can, a peanut can. It got rusty really fast. And so I threw it away. But um, you can see that there's the dough inside of there. And what you do is once the dough's in your pan, your pot or your pan or container, I guess it's a container, you're going to have some kind of lid over it. Um, I have, I'll show you in a minute, the lid, some of the containers I use for this, but a lot of them don't come with lids. So I use a, a tin foil and an elastic right now or a string. And then the other one, I, then you set the pot down inside and then you put water around the pot. You wait till it, you can fill it. As the water goes in, all of a sudden it starts to float. As soon as it starts to float, that's when you turn off the water and put it on the stove, bring it to a boil. Once it boils for the amount of time based on the size of your container and what you've got in it, for basic bread, it's 15 to 20 minutes. If it's got something like, like I said, the extra cheese or um, it's the, um, like a sweet bread or you've added some things to it, then I would go 20 to 25 minutes. You're not gonna hurt it. And right now we have fuel. So it's better to let it boil longer and um, enjoy your bread. Because once you pull it out and it's not done all the way, you're done. You're gonna throw that away, <laughs> right? Or you're gonna make, you're gonna cut it in pieces and toast it and then make little crackers out of it. Cause it always tastes good when you do that. Um, and then you, so then you put, make sure the lid's on it and then you're gonna put it down into a thermal cooker with the um, Hope Sack thermal cooker. I like to use these oven bags. It just keeps my hope sack clean longer. That's really the only reason I put the pot down in it. Uh, and then once you put it down in, you put the lid on it and you just wait. With bread, you can leave it in there. I'd leave it in an hour and a half to two hours to make sure it's done. But after that, you can leave it in for eight hours. It's just going to sit and wait for you. Okay. It's, you just wait. Um, oh, there you go. You're just going to wait. There's my clock. All right. Natural yeast bread. Um, I had somebody comment on the video that I finally got posted. <laughs> By the way, we've had like 400, 350 people in a week already watch that video. And one of the people's like, you know, that's they love the information on natural yeast bread because the thing about natural yeast, all the instructions I just gave you, you follow all of them except for one. And that is you make sure you have been super patient. So it's done all the rises that it's supposed to rise for natural yeast. And even the 
most importantly, the very last step, you know, so it's going to take you a couple of days to make natural yeast bread from the beginning to the end, because you've got several, you're going to let that yeast, you know, it's going to rise one time, maybe two times, I don't know, depending on your recipe, but that last rise, you make sure that it's right up to almost where you want it to be risen in the container that's going to go in the pot that it's actually going to cook in. Because if you think it's going to rise um, like it does with an instant yeast, it's not. You're going to end up with a brick. And that brick makes really, really good um, crackers, but it doesn't make good bread. So, um, so make sure that you let that rise that last time and it's already in the container that you're going to cook it in. And then go ahead and follow the instructions as before you let it cook for, I'd probably do a good 20 minutes in a regular container. And then, um, and then you just boil it and let it sit in there and it'll be delicious. It'll be great. It'll taste delicious. Like I showed you last week though, or last month, just air that out a little bit. Once you open your bread and you set it out, I put it on a, on a breadboard and just let it sit for a little bit or a rack and just let the air sort of pulls a little bit of the moisture that's because it is going to be a little bit of heavier dough or of heavier bread. And, um, but like I said, my, by the time that did that and I went to my party, everybody loved it. We'll be going over containers for bread uh, later in the presentation, I believe. So the different containers that are here and I have them all in here. So we'll talk about those later. Let's move to rice because rice is its own, um, it's got its own challenges, right? Let's see what my other thing says. Okay, it's got its own challenges. And this is because rice is what you cook and you don't wanna have extra water sitting in it. So it has to be the exact amount of rice with the water, with the thermal cooker, okay? So this is what we found. It's, this is rice and quinoa, and I wanted to put this recipe here. It's in my book. But the reason I want to put it here is because rice and quinoa cook exactly the same. They require the same amount of water to the amount of rice. So in this particular one, it's two and a half cups long grain rice and one cup quinoa, okay? In other words, if you wanted to do just rice, it would be two and a half cups rice. Or if you want to do just quinoa, it'd be two and a half cups quinoa to four cups of water, okay? Pinch of salt. And what you're going to do is bring it to a boil and let it boil for three minutes. And then you're going to put it in the thermal cooker. Okay. That is for um, the bigger pot. All right. That particular recipe, two and a half cups water to one and a half cup of rice fits perfectly in the, this pot. And this is a seven liter. So it's the top piece, right? The top two and a half liter pot. So it'll go, it'll cook really nice in here and it'll cook up and fit nicely into here. So if I'm, I used to cater, right? So if I was needing to cook for a lot of people and I wanted to do the whole thing, I would triple it for the recipe. It seemed like that's what I did. Tripled it. Oh, I hope so. It's in here, there, there, and there, right? Probably did just do a little bit more than triple, but that's pretty much how you did to fill the whole thing. And I started out thinking I needed to do more. And I remember messing up my rice so much. Don't think you have to cook way more. Test it before you want to make a lot, maybe. Um, and then I'm like, what I'm doing is I'm like way more than tripling it in this cooker. And then if you put too much rice in the big pot, right, and you're cooking, putting too much, it ends up super mushy or I don't know if the mushy is the right word. It's just when you have too much rice in there and there's not room for it to expand, it doesn't taste too hot or the texture's off. So make sure you don't over, over put too much in if you're trying to make a bulk amount of rice. Um, okay, so rice, the basic, so that's basically it. You put your, um, your water, rice, a little bit of salt, set it on the stove, bring it to a boil. Once it's boiling, you let it boil for three minutes and put it in a thermal cooker or in the inside of this pot. We've got food in here boiling already. Put this in there, put it in the thermal cooker, leave it for an hour and a half to two hours or eight hours. It doesn't really matter. It's just gonna sit there. Once it gets to the warming temperature, it's just gonna warm it. Um, <clears throat> 
Will it be done before for an hour and a half or two hours? Yeah, probably. Like I've mentioned before, when I talk about timing in a thermal cooker, I'm looking at um, if I'm making it in less than two hours and I want to eat it, I'm probably cooking it a different way. It's not always true with rice, but for the most part, that's how I wrote the book. So everything stays in there from two to eight hours or longer. Um, rice is, I, someday I'd love to figure out exactly when everything is actually done because I know it can be done before then. And I'll tell you a story in just a sec, what the next slide or two and um, how I learned a lot about rice. So remember, I just told you for a long time, I did three minute boil, right? So let's see how we can adapt to that and what I found out, unless I have another one ahead of here. Let's see what we got. So hopefully that's clear right there. Two and a half cups of water, four cups of, I mean, two and a half cups of rice, four cups of water. So this was my first trip to Kenya. <clears throat> and these ladies, they thought I was absolutely crazy to come and show them that I could cook rice or cook food in a bag. Um, this is in Encreta, Kenya. And you can see that their faces are like, I don't know, some of them are like this. I don't know why we're standing here. We just have to stand here with her for a minute. I don't know. And so um, let me see what else. Okay. So what happened is right that building behind us, there's a couple fireplace fires inside of there where they do the cooking and they've just kept it out of, um, out of the weather. So they've covered this, covered it over. And so, and, and right across from us, behind like looking in front we're looking toward another building that is they use it as a, a community building and a church and it looks a lot like the building behind there except for it's a lot bigger and so right behind where that picture is i sat there for quite a while and we made rice and potatoes and this is the thing is that what happened that day was i brought the thermal cooker and pots from the hotel. And they would not put the pots from the hotel on top of the stove because they didn't want it to go black. They didn't want to wreck the pots from the hotel. So the women would not put them on the stove. So I was like, uh oh, how am I going to cook potatoes and rice with no, not boiling? I mean, from every everything from before then, I was always, always boiling it for three minutes, two and a half cups of water, or no, two and a half cups of rice four cups of water and I boiled it. So I think we probably doubled that to put in the pot this day. So we did um, probably eight cups of water and five cups of rice. But what happened is we put the rice in there and then they just had to carry the water and dump it in, right? They brought in the water from boiling. It was boiling like crazy, but they just came, brought it around the corner and dumped it in my pot. And I'm like, this should be interesting because I, I didn't know if it was going to work. And then it was an, and then I didn't get my whole two hours because it, it, we got behind time and they just wanted to get it open. So we went into the other room place and I had two of these. One had rice, one had potatoes. They set them down and I watched my video yesterday and it was really interesting to watch because the women, uh, they were just, I was talking there and you could hear everything. And then right as we were going down to open these cookers up, the rain started. And if you notice, that's a tin roof. It was so loud. And I didn't get the video I would have liked because they were showing the pots. Whoever took my video was showing the pots. But I just remember the looks on those women's faces. And um, this little lady right here on the right, I think the shortest one, I think she's one of the probably the matriarchs of the, the area, because she was the one in there just checking things out to see if this was going to work. And she was super interested to see if it was going to work. But all of these ladies were like in shock and happy that it had worked because when they opened that up, that rice looked absolutely perfect, which was super grateful for me. I was so grateful that it was, it was about an hour and 20 minutes. So this is just things you can remember and learn about that. It was about an hour and 20 minutes. And then, um, but by the time I got done talking, maybe it was closer to an hour and a half. So it was really close to the hour and a half, hour and 20 minutes. And these women were so excited. And all I knew was that I didn't want to stir that because what really was happening, if you think about it, the problem I would have had is that sure, the rice on top was cooked, but the weight of the water meant the water was on the bottom. 
I needed to adjust the amount of water to rice because I didn't get the opportunity to evaporate out any water, right? At four cups of water, there needed to be evaporation happen. There was plenty of water in there to, to expand the rice, which it did, and it looked beautiful, but the water on the bottom wasn't evaporated. So um, what I learned from that is I don't have to have a three minute boil. I just need it to come to a boil, but if I can have it come to a boil, I'm gonna to have to adapt the amount of the rice. Have I done the math on that? No, nope, I haven't. Cause you know what? I'm home now and I can boil it for three minutes. And we have pots for them to use now in Kenya and the boiling isn't a problem. When I went back and did the Hope Sack certification with them, that time we were under trees. Our kitchen was under trees. There were two fires going and they had food going on both sides and they showed me how they had learned to use a thermal cooker. And I think for that, they know how to use it better than I do for their, their food. Right. And we, they did, so they sauteed onions and peppers and they added, then they tossed the rice a bit in the oil and vegetables and then added the water and brought it to a boil and let it boil for a couple of minutes and then put it in the cooker. And by the time they were done with that, it was just absolutely perfect with all the seasoning and everything in it. And that's by, so that's what happened between November and March when I went back is they had totally learned how to use these and they know, and they use them. They know how to use them. So that's the story on rice. And it just sort of teaches the principles of things can be adapted. I teach you principles, but as you learn how to use a thermal cooker, don't think you need to always go back to exactly what Cindy said, because you found out a better way to do it and what worked for you, right? All right, let's talk about beans and legumes. Um, when it comes to these, they are definitely really, really good to store, right? We can store them and they last for a long time, but they do get old. And so there's things to remember and things to do with old beans. Um, let's see, we got a comment. Let's see what we got before we move on. Um, <laughs> yes, I can get a Kenyan recipe for rice. In fact, one thing really quick about the Kenya and the food that we cook, we cook there when we go, you know, we, it's always the same when we go eat with the people. And this is just a sort of an interesting fact. They have a certain seasoning and I should bring the seasoning home. Maybe I will in June and, and grab some of that seasoning and bring it back. But there's a certain seasoning packet that they all like. And then, and they put it in the potatoes and probably the rice, but they do potatoes, um, a potato dish, a rice dish, and they might have a little bit of meat in maybe the potatoes. And then they do a cabbage, a cooked cabbage. And that's, what we have every time if there's a group of people that we're eating with. If we're at our um, guest house, we have a guest house on the Masai Mara that we stay at. And it's actually our group, it's 100 humanitarians, the Empernot a Cultural Center is what we're building. And um, the guest house has been built and we have a, a cook there, a chef and his food. I mean, it is delicious. There is some delicious Kenyan food, but as far as traditionally what we eat with the Masai when we eat with them, it's a potato with some meat in it, um, usually chicken for us because we don't, we have to be real careful with what we eat there as far as their, um, their, like we don't want sheep or goat because we can't, we have to, we have to be careful where they get the meat for us because we don't want to be sick while we're there. Our bodies just can't quite help handle um, some of the things in the meats. And then um, they do the rice, which is delicious. And, um, then, like I said, the cabbage and the cabbage is super good too. Just the way they season it. Anyway, just a little tidbit. Thanks for that comment about Kenyan food. You're right though. I'd really like to get some recipes from all the places and how they're using them. Um, the places that I send the hope sacks and teach thermal cooking. It would be awesome to be able to get some of those main recipes back and add it to the, um, the live cookbook that I have. And those are in my plans. If time would slow down for me, that would be awesome. I don't know. All right. So legumes, let's go over some basic things about what I've learned about them. Okay. When I was writing my cookbook, people, there's always stuff about, do you salt or do you not salt when you're cooking and soaking beans? I wish I could find this information again, but I remember I went to the library. I almost positive it was a Cook's Illustrated book and it was something about myths in cooking and they did all these tests and one of them was with beans and they said to salt 
it when you soak and to salt it when you cook. There's a really important step between the two and that is to make sure and strain it. Strain the original salt water off and then you put fresh water and new salt to cook. So I think in my book it talks about, I think it's a tablespoon of, of salt when you're soaking, you rinse all that off and then you put a teaspoon in to cook on a basic four cup. I don't know, it seems like it's a four cup. I've got it right there, two cups. Yeah, four cups, two pounds of dry beans. All right, and I thought this is just the instructions I cut and paste off my uh, out of my book last night to make it a little easier. Pre-soaking is really important with legumes, and that is because it assists in digestion. You know, it breaks down that um, that enzyme that creates gas, right? So, or whatever it is that does it. So, it's really important to pre-soak, and it helps not rob the nutrition from your body, but helps distribute nutrition. Um, and you want to also pre-soak it because it saves fuel because you're going to cook the beans faster when it's time to cook them because you've already softened up that outside hard coating. Um, beans are a powerhouse of nutrition. And the beauty of that, you know, people are like, how do I cook my beans um, to get them to cook quickly? We can cook them for, boil them for a couple hours or however long you need to boil them till they're done, which uses a ton of fuel. Um, you can also use a pressure cooker um, to cook them. And sometimes you can do that really fast. The thing about a pressure cooker is your temperature is going up a lot higher than if you use a thermal cooker. Um, because it goes like, I think 240. I don't really know, but it goes really high. It works. So if you have old beans that you can't get soft in some other way, use a pressure cooker because it doesn't matter at that point. You just want to cook it. But the beauty of using a thermal cooker is that it will, um, it's, it keeps it not, it's not going over boiling point, right? So you're at 212 basically to cook those beans and you're going to bring um so what you're going to do let's go over the things this says you're going to start with four cups of beans um, about two pounds of dry beans and um i've got a couple other notes in there so i'm going to rinse the beans i'm going to place them in a nice big bowl and add 12 cups of water or just fill them cover them with water <clears throat> i was writing a cookbook so i had to come up with exact amounts do I do that in my real life? I don't think so. One tablespoon of sea salt, and then I let it sit for six to 12 hours. Then you make sure and rinse those beans off and then put them in the seven liter pot or a pot. This is a seven liter. You're just gonna use the bottom. So the beauty of it is this is a seven liter. You're gonna do it at the bottom here, but guess what? So seven liter minus two and a half liters that fit on the top is right around five liters or four and a half liters, right? And this is a 5.5 liter. So the bottom of this and the top and this whole pot are gonna hold approximately the same amounts. So you could do this recipe in the bottom of this or just use the whole thing of this, okay? And that goes with any recipe. It took me a while to figure that out. Like I'm like people, you know, with to help people that have the 5.5 or a five liter over a seven liter, people are trying to figure out the recipes. No, just if you have one that's gonna fit the bottom of this, you're gonna to have to add something in this top pot so you can do the whole thing with a smaller one, okay? All right, so you're gonna rinse it. You're gonna put them in the seven liter pot or in this pot and you're not gonna put anything on top. Um, you're gonna add water. This says eight cups of water um, and one teaspoon of salt to the dry beans. So the reason I add it, so you're gonna do that eight cups is probably what fits perfect in the bottom part of this one, right? And then it leaves me um, enough space to add something here, all right? If I don't wanna add something here, what I'm gonna do is just finish filling this with water because then it's about thermal mass. It doesn't matter because you're gonna strain off the water. This one, I'll probably add a little bit more water because it's still got a little more space in there that I could fill with water. All right. Okay, so then you're gonna bring them to a boil. Once it's to a boil, you're gonna let it boil 10 minutes and then you're gonna put it in the thermal cooker and leave it at least six hours, okay? If they're old beans, that's the trick. There's little things you can add to soaking them. Some people soak them in distilled water and swear that works. Some people add soda and say that works. Um, there's just a whole bunch of, you know, ways to, to try and help those old beans get soft. If you open it up and they're still hard, you can stick the pot back on the stove and bring it to a boil and boil it and you know boil it another 20 minutes or whatever, trying to soften those up. 
If in the end, the beans will not go soft, you might just grind them for flour. You can do that. Just make sure you're adding it to other things too, because something made with straight bean flour might be hard, a little hard to digest, especially if you're not used to it. Um, anyway, so there's some basic information on beans. This is the bean recipe that I made. Um, I found this recipe and adapted it to what I wanted to do. This is super simple to make. And what I usually do is just, um, once I have my beans rinsed and, and rinsed and soaked, I just dump all this stuff in the thermal cooker in here. So I take um, a can of diced tomato, a pound of beans, and I think uh, it should say, if I double this, I can't remember to fill this. Somewhere I, I say that. I think it's it definitely is more than what this is. I'm thinking it's doubled to do that. So it's probably two pounds of beans, two cans of diced tomatoes. Um, and so once it's, it's there, the beans have been high, uh, hydrated, but I'm going to put them in here. I just dump the tomatoes in the green chilies, bacon. I cut up onion and drop it in and put the seasonings, right? Um, you can do it where you put a little oil and saute the onions. I haven't really done that. I mean, for this particular recipe, I just showing, I'm just showing how to do it fast. And I just dump everything in and then I bring it to a boil boil it for 10 minutes and put it inside of a thermal cooker or hope sack. The cilantro you used at the end to top it. Um, this is a thing, when I made this the first time I went to Mexico, I, it's one of those times when you're like, these are the words I need to say, right? And what I said is, um, when was the last time you boiled your beans with 10 minutes worth of fuel? And that's when the whole room erupted. And I was like, oh, I think this is a thing. That's what went through my mind. I knew those were the words I need to say. And then, oh, I think this is a thing is what came to my mind. Like, I think I'm supposed to do this and look at it. How many, this is, that was probably 2018. Yeah. 2018 um, ish when I went, yeah. When I went to Mexico for the first time with Builders Without Borders and look where we are. It's 2022 and I'm still crazy, but it's fun. Right. I like it. So um, anyway, that's the basics on beans. Um, if you can think of anything else, those are the, I think we hit the most important points. You can have lots of success with beans. Um, anyway, lots of recipes out there for beans. So let's talk about freeze dried and dehydrated meals. Like I said, I have 11 recipes for this in my book. So I mix and match freeze dried and dehydrated, but obviously a couple tips and when you make recipes this way. Um, when you open a can of freeze dried stuff and it has a date on it, immediately when you remark your, um, your jar to put a date on it, you're going to right off the top, take off five years to, to extend the life for the life of it. If you're going to include in this dehydrated food, it's not going to be, the shelf life isn't going to be as long. Right. So maybe this is something you put in your food storage and you're going to be rotating them. I don't know. It's still going to last a while. I just don't know the exact amount if you're making your own dehydrated food. So I don't know how to put a date on that. Um, I, I like dehydrating my own stuff, so I do do it and I'll add it. But my mom does have a freeze dryer now, so we can actually do the freeze dryers ourselves, too. And then, then it's the same thing. How long does it actually last? I don't really know so far. I just um, really enjoy uh, using the freeze dried dehydrated meals and having them in food storage. But the basic principle in knowing when to put the stuff together is just if you're opening a can of freeze dried stuff, you look at the date and take five years off. What I want to show you is I should have put the picture in here, but I didn't. So I'll show you this that's in the book. But this is black bean soup, right? So this, this is, an, this is the ingredient and I know it's backwards, but it's, I think it's backwards for you guys, right? Anyway, I'm not going to find that out. So this is for one meal. This is what fits in a jar or in a container, but I've made them to fit in a jar just because then it's, I can have some kind of consistency. So the idea is if you make this once and you really like it, um, yes, the chicken and broccoli recipe is in the book. It is in the book. Okay. All those recipes are. 
In fact, I can show you that one right now, I think. It's more like a casserole, so it's gonna come out thicker in the end because it's gonna absorb all the water. That's the same thing. Here's the, instruct the ingredients, and then here's for one jar. Once you find out if you like it, then you, you can buy this amount of bulk and have 12 jars or 12 containers and divide it up with this amount in each. And then this amount makes 12 of those, okay? Just ignore those two lines, they don't matter. And then this right here is the instructions, which are also in the back of the book. So you can just make a copy of the page and then you can cut them out and put them on your jar, okay? Also, if you get a digital form of this, a digital one, um, it, it should come with also that information like the live digital book will have it in there and the other digital. It's also, there's a place on my website. If you can't for some reason get it, you can just email me or look around in my miscellaneous stuff on my website. And I've got a downloadable um, thing for those pieces. Okay. I hope that made sense. I think it made sense. I don't know. You guys will let me know, right? If it doesn't make sense, something I say so I can fix it anyway. So here's, um, Back to this picture. So here's that, yep, the chicken and broccoli casserole. It's definitely in the book because we just looked at it. And then here is the, um, this is the Italian wedding soup or the Zuppa Toscana. And this is freeze dried. Um, this, I, or, and dehydrated, because honestly, I think I use the potatoes or mostly just dehydrated potatoes in this. So it's a combination of the two. And since I'm buying them, you can look at the, the same thing and take five years off. That's what I do if you're buying the freeze dried stuff or the dehydrated stuff. And if you look at the one on the right, it's a different potato. And I put that in there. Um, okay, yes, we will let you know. Thank you. We, yes, this will be able, you'll be able to watch this again. In fact, because you're registered, um, you will receive the email that has it on. I'll put it on YouTube for a couple weeks or so, maybe three, I don't know, whenever I get around to take it off and I'll archive it into the course, okay? And I'm gonna break up little pieces and put them on YouTube when life decides to give me some time so that we, I do more reels, right? I think reels are important to get my numbers up in YouTube because people are gonna watch so much. Very few people are actually gonna watch this all the way through again, right? Um, a few will that are missed it and they want the information, but it's not going to be the masses. Um, the last one, I, last time I checked the bread one, the average was 11 minutes watching, right? And it's an hour long, it's an hour long, but the average is 11 minutes because that's just how it works with YouTube and people watching videos, which is fine with me. It's just the reality of it. If I get each little section out or get different sections out and I do them short, do some shorts. That's what my plan is, I guess. Reels or shorts, I don't know. With time. Okay, we talked about 90 day food storage, right? So I have another section of the book where it talks about 90 days. And you can see this recipe right here is um, looks like taco soup. And so I've used in it several items that I've prepared. You can see that I've, I've made tomatoes from my garden and I did some hamburger and I bottled some hamburger in the pressure cooker. And then the other one is a jar that has the freeze dried beans or no, they're dehydrated beans. So in my book, when you talk about when the legume section, I also teach how to then after you cook the beans, you can dehydrate some of them. And then that's what's actually in this is some are some dehydrated beans. So then this recipe is done really, really fast. In fact, once it brings to a boil, it's actually done and you're just using it in a thermal cooker to stay hot, okay? So I'm using a mixture of canned goods, um, and freeze dried, dehydrated, and uh, well, the cans and the canned. Does that make sense? Where I canned them or I bottled them. And basically, you can see the olives are there from just a store bought can. And that's the idea behind a ready meal is something that's sort of a 90 day food storage item, which technically will last longer, but it's something where you're rotating quite often and you're trying to utilize that food. Actually, all our food stores should be rotated, but it gets harder as you get less people, right? So anyway, this is a really good recipe. This recipe is also, I have in the, in my book, it's a fresh ingredients one. And I have a taco soup recipe that's made in the blender and it's just basically vegetables, which is also really good. 
yeah, this is just like a bag mail. I just called it a bucket mail because I didn't want to use the bag mail, but it is, it's a bag mail. That's exactly what some people have called them. Okay. All right. So pasta. Okay. Pasta hates the thermal cooker, which is so sad because me and, you know, I served a mission in Italy. I left half my heart in Italy. And here we go. Pasta does not like a thermal cooker because it gets mushy. But I have some tips and I thought of more. So any way you can make this work is awesome. Um, but let me share some with you. Some options for making successful pasta. Um, oh, let me see. Oh, wow. I'm already talking a lot and we haven't even got over the basics. But anyway, it's okay. So um, you can put it. So what I would do is I would put pasta in a pre do some pasta, like maybe cook some pasta up and I'll make it al dente. So it's a couple minutes short of being finished. So if you're cooking pasta for 11 minutes, they're boiling it for 11 minutes, then let's say maybe eight minutes in, you're going to take it off and you're going to strain it and put it in a little baggie and then put the baggie inside of the upper pot. Okay. Or you could do the same thing make it al dente. And instead of putting in a baggie, because some people are like, I don't want to use a baggie. It's got, it doesn't sound like a good thing to use, or I don't have it. It's not sustainable, whatever. So then you're going to put, toss it with a little oil and put it in the top pot. And then if you've got something that you're boiling here, you can actually put this in and the lid on and then let it boil for a few more minutes and let that heat up and get some hot, um, you know, get the thermal mass going again. But once you've taken the water out, it's going to soften a little more, but it's not going to add more water to your pasta. Because believe me, I have made it and opened it like four hours later and it's so mushy, you have to throw the whole thing away. It's not going to work. So you can also adjust time. You can make it like normal, put it in a thermal cooker. And if you're going to eat within two hours, then you're good to go. Um, those egg noodles seem to last three hours okay with this technique. If it's gonna go more than that, you wanna use another way. If it goes over that amount of time, do a different one, use less liquid. So go to my book and look at the lasagna recipe. This is the best way to explain it. Um, we're just gonna not put as much liquid in it. And it's, I even use those like baking noodles, the baking lasagna noodles. And then they absorb less, you know, they're just made for baking and it absorbs that amount it needs. Um, so there's little tricks you can do like that. Um, that's not something that's actually going to come to a boil. You're just going to carefully not want to scorch it, let it heat up. It's not going to get to the full boiling point. So you're going to manipulate a little bit with how long it will stay hot. Okay. Usually you're going to eat something like this technique within four or five hours. Okay. And there's more information in my book on how to do that. Um, meals in a jar, uh, you can like, um, you know, like I did the little, I have leftover pasta. So I put them in mason jars and just layer them like, like lasagna. And then you're going to use um, container cooking and put the mason jars down in here, surround them with water, bring it to a boil. And then the pasta is not going to be too mushy because it's exactly the amount of liquid that you need in it. And they're not going to go mushy. Um, another thing is you can, right before you're done, ready to eat, you can bring, since you're pulling, if you have a hot thing of food and you want to eat soon, and it's been like, I don't know, six or seven hours, and now you're ready to pull the stuff out, you can take this out, it's going to be nice and hot, just bring it back to a quick boil, put your pasta inside, let that boil for um, the 11 minutes or however long till your pasta is done, and then you're ready to eat. So you're just going to do that at the end instead of the beginning. You just plan that step in. Or cook your pasta separately right at the end, right? Or whenever, and then you've got the pasta is ready separately and it's perfect and you're not going to have a problem with the pasta that way. Yeah, pasta doesn't like it. It just goes into back to mushy flour and water, right? Okay, so that's sort of the, the items that I've got for stored items right now. And now what I'd like to do is just go real quick through. I know we're at an hour and 15 minutes. So <laughs> I got it. So now we're just gonna go through basically how to use a thermal cooker. And so the, the questions that you might have as far as some of the basics, we can answer them now. So these are the benefits of retained heat cooking or thermal cooking. Fuel savings, like I mentioned, this is my group in Mexico, and they love the fuel savings aspect of it because they have really expensive fuel. 
costs down there. Um, health is another one. Uh, this is a kitchen in Kenya. Oh, good. Thank you for being willing to be here, Teresa, and being okay with me rambling on and on. <laughs> okay. But it's okay. I, hopefully the information's good. So this is Kenya. This is in Karate, Kenya. If you look, this is the same lady that was standing next to me when I was holding the big thing. And she has much more smile on her face now, right? This was a little bit later after she discovered that the thermal cooking actually worked. But you can see this is her kitchen um, hut. And there's, it's just so dark in there. That's the thing that hits me every time is how dark it is. It's always dark, but they're breathing those fumes all the time. So if we can help them be able to be doing something else in another location than in the hut where it's all smoky all the time, then it's going to help increase um, in health. And that's all over the world where women are cooking over open fires or are having fires in their huts, right? All right. And time. This is also in, in Kreta. And um, this is our Hope Sack. Uh, this is our Hope Sack Club. They made a little club. This is the day that they made and, and stuffed their Hope Sacks. Um, and Hope Sacks are just a thermal cooker for you guys that don't know. It's just that this is the one I designed for charity to be able to help people. And you can see the little short ladies right there in front the one that was in the other pictures too. And so these, they have all passed off their Hope Sack certification and they know how to use that bag. That's for sure. How to use a thermal cooker. Like I mentioned before, you're gonna boil, you're gonna insulate and you're gonna wait. What is required with retained heat cooking or thermal cooking is some kind of moisture, water, a liquid of some kind. It doesn't have to be water per se, but you, you're bringing something to a boil. If it's not coming to a boil, then you're heating it up very, very slowly and adjusting the temperatures, being aware of temperature and timing if you're making it, if you're adapting those things. But for the basic principles, you're bringing something to a boil. And that's the point of thermal cooking. Mistakes in temperature tests in, in uh, I can never see this. You guys can see it, but I can't. Um, mistakes in temperature tests and measuring in time and in other conditions may result in failures, which must not be imputed to the cooker, but the cook. Okay. And so if you feel like something wasn't successful, oops, something wasn't successful, just realize that it's a little bit of information that you still need to learn. You can email me, you can ask a question, you can think through it in your mind. Why did I have that result? What went into it that created that result, right? We have a cause and effect. What did I do at the beginning that caused the end result? And if you think through that or ask a question or research or go look back on a video or my book or find that information, you're going to go, oh, that's what it is. And you try it again and you're going to you're going to end up with success because it's science and there is a way to do this. It's just a matter of understanding. Right. And it's not hard. None of it's hard. It's pretty simple, really. It's just there's several things that need to fall into place. OK, maximum efficiency. We have fuel savings. Um, what I did is when I think of maximum efficiency, when I was writing the book, right, what I wanted to do is I wanted fuel savings and I wanted to be able to retain heat at least eight hours or more because then I knew I had a good cooker. So when I talk about how much time or whatever or how much um, volume, it's all because I wanted to meet these, these parameters. That doesn't mean you have to all the time. You totally can adapt it and manipulate things for other um, and do it differently. Um, okay, awesome. All right. Okay. Yes, we're. Um, all right. The dues. Something must come to a boil. You have to bring something to a boil with thermal cooking. That's just, it has to happen. That's why there has to be liquid. And you want your pot 75 to 80% full. Remember, we're talking maximum efficiency now. The don'ts, don't put anything frozen in it. Make sure that it's room temperature when you start to boiling, or you want to boil a little longer to make sure whatever's inside of there isn't cold in the center or frozen in the center because it'll drop the temperature of your pot once you take it off the heat. No peaking. This was really super hard at first. 
You want to tend to open it up and look at it and see if it's cooking or if it's done. But every time you do that, you're going to lose more heat. So just you'll get to the point where it doesn't matter, um, which reminds me, I have something that I should open now to show you what I made. In fact, maybe I'll take a break now for those of you that have seen this before and don't want to stay for this part. I need to leave. So let me show you what I did. This is a Stanley. I'll send a link over because I found these on Amazon. I can send a link when I send the email out with this, if anybody's interested. This is just a thermos. And I had several people talking about it because they were using it. And um, I wanted to, to use it. Today seemed like a perfect day to use it because I was just gonna make breakfast. And I've known forever that you could put oatmeal in a thermos and have breakfast in the morning. And this one, um, it's, anyway, so I don't have any idea how it worked. All I did is poured the hot water. So what I did is I put two cups, two cups, two cups of oatmeal. I think it's whole grain, whole oats, like rolled oats and a little bit of salt and um, boiling water, maybe six cups of water. And then this just comes up and I don't know if it's successful because I've the only couple times I made oatmeal, I didn't do a very good job. But I know I've had delicious oatmeal that people made in a home cooker. So I don't know if my water is right. I tried to Google it a little bit. But it's, oh no, it's fine. It's totally fine. Look, it's totally ready to eat. See, my oatmeal worked. Yay, guess what I'm having for breakfast? I'm having oatmeal. Let me see if my, yeah. Okay. It's not too hot. It's not too hot, but think about what we're going to talk is thermal mass next, right? And that's only halfway full. The other thing I realized this morning is my little thing right here to let air out was open all night. See that? I didn't want that because what I did is I let air out all night, right? So it's, it's lukewarm, but it's not hot. And another thing that we're going to talk about right now and the reasons why that wouldn't be super hot, um, Let's evaluate that a little bit as we go through the next steps and teach the principles of thermal cooking. Okay. But it's definitely totally done. My water was the right amount. I did two cups of um, oats and six cups of water. Okay. And that's what it is. What I'm going to do with this, so I'm going to have some for breakfast, probably with some um, fruit, dried fruit, nuts, a little bit of um, coke, uh, almond milk. And, it, and honey, because I have honey from the bees, which is delicious. And then I might make some cupcakes or something out of the rest, right? Because I'm not going to, or else I can save it for other mornings. But I like the idea that I can also add this to like make a treat. And it makes it healthy, a healthy treat. I do that a lot. When I used to test a lot, because I'd come up with so much extra food, I'm like, how can I use all this extra food? Especially when I was using grains. So there we go. Um, okay, let's get back to the presentation. That's actually good because we're going to talk about, like I mentioned, some of the things that I just, what we just saw a minute ago. Okay, and I, I put that in last night at midnight. Was it midnight or 11? I don't know. And so it's in, they've been in there 10 hours and it's still warm, right? And it's a smaller unit. We're going to talk about that right now. So that's going to teach us. Okay, so principles of thermal cooking. We've got thermal mass, which means the amount of. So in that particular pot in the Stanley, I um, wasn't able to bring it to a boil. I just poured hot water on it. So it's going to decrease the temperature right there, but it's only half full. So the space of air is going to right there is going to drop my temperature right there. Because when we talk about thermal mass, what we're doing is we're taking something and we're putting heat into it. Like when we put it on the stove, then we take it off the stove, the heat's gonna go out of it, correct? So what we're doing with retained heat cooking or insulated cooking is we're adding insulation. So first we put it on the stove and the heat goes in. Then we add an insulator. So we add insulation on the outside part. So as the air tries to go out, it's stopped and it goes out slower. Okay. So there's several types of insulators that we're going to talk about. That particular one is a vacuum. A Stanley is going to be a vacuum sealed insulator, which is one of the best. That's why it's even warm at all. 
after 10 hours, 10 or 11 hours, it might even be 11 hours. So what we do is we've got, so you're gonna insulate the pot. So here, here you can see I have two, two insulators that are exactly the same and two pots that are different sizes. So if I bring the pots to a boil at the same time and I put them in the insulator, well, first of all, if I bring it to a boil, which one's gonna, which one's gonna come to a boil first? It's never gonna be different ever. The small one will always boil first because there's less thermal mass, all right? So then if I just let them cool by themselves, the small one will always cool the fastest because there's less thermal mass for the exact same reason. But let's say that I brought them to a boil and um, then as soon as they were both at a boil, I put them inside of these particular, these exactly the same insulators. And then I wait and see how fast they cool. The one that will cool the fastest is exactly the same. It will always be the small one because there's less thermal mass. But what happened was I added an insulator so it will extend the amount of time that it will stay hot. All right, it'll stay hot longer. Both of them will. In fact, the hope sack loses about two and a half degrees an hour if it's filled with shredded foam, okay? Is it possible to have the smaller pot retain the heat as long as the larger pot? How? Since I put how on there, you can probably guarantee that it definitely is gonna happen. You can find ways to have the smaller pot retain the heat as long as the larger pot. This is the first option that everybody sees right off the bat, add more insulation. So if you look at the Saratoga Jack 5.5 liter and the seven liter Saratoga Jack, um, what you see is that the pots actually look close to the same size. The difference is that the 5.5 has added extra insulation to compensate for less thermal mass. So they retain heat about the same. Speaking of Saratoga Jacks, Amy and Jack messaged me last week and they decided to place another order for these cookers. She says she's gonna order 300 cookers I don't know, if, I mean, that's what she said. So she's taken pre-orders for them. I've already posted them on my website. So if you would like to pre-order them, that means you're gonna pay for them however long ahead, which is now, and then you're guaranteed one when they get there. Um, and it will come sometime in summer, late summer, I'm guessing, or into the fall. I have no idea. Last time it took them from uh, February till August to get here. but. They have been in high demand lately. I still have people calling me and asking me for them and I don't have any, but at least I can have them order them. I also have an idea that might help with the seven liters. And if it comes about and I'm able to pull this off, we might actually get some ahead of time. So if you end up ordering a seven liter and I can figure out how to come up with the exact same thing, I'll reach out to you and let you know that of what it is and you can have the option to either wait for them or, or um, and see if you want my other option. I can't say it yet because I don't know yet, but I'm excited if it works because then I have another way to, to have cookers because so many people want them, okay? Uh, a seven liter will feed 10 to 12, depending on what you're fixing, okay? Um, like if I make, if I, I, I have a potluck dinner, that's just like making a meal in a seven liter, they say 10 to 12. But if I have a couple, let's say I'm making um, potato salad and baked beans, and I'm filling them, it's gonna serve way more than that because I'm gonna take them maybe to like a potluck dinner and I'm gonna serve 30 people with it, right? Does that make sense? So it sort of depends on what you're using them for, but generally just to fill and serve a family is 10 to 12, okay, for the seven liter. All right. So increase the amount of insulation. Secondly, um, increase the quality of the insulation. So let me show you a couple things. You're welcome. Um, all right. So we're gonna increase the quality of the insulation. So the Stanley is vacuum sealed. This is the most, this is the best quality insulator you can get is vacuum. Um, a Mr. D, these are out of England. 
is a vacuum sealed. So like the Stanley, the insulation is great on this one too. And this is a three liter, by the way. The Saratoga Jack is a foam unit. It retains heat. This unit is going to retain heat just a little bit longer than this one, but this is seven liter and this is three. Okay. There's a couple of reasons for that. I'll show you in a minute. One of the, the reasons this stays hot so long with the volume is because of the insulation. But the Saratoga Jack ones, they insulate about the same and they are the foam units. Okay. And then you can find handmade ones. This is obviously the Hope Sack. Um, they also have Wonder Ovens and Wonder Bags that are made with fabric like these. This, this particular um, one loses two and a half degrees an hour. Just to put that in perspective, this, if it's full, will leave will lose around seven, six or seven. Okay. This one, these are the same, six or seven. Okay, six or seven degrees an hour. So um, that sort of gives you an idea. I have a tiger. This tiger is a six or seven liter. I'm not exactly sure. I'm guessing it's close to a seven. And um, because it's a vacuum sealed, it's gonna probably lose less than, I'm guessing around five. I haven't tested it, okay? Um, do you cook in the Stanley or does it just keep pre-cooked foods hot? Yeah, the Stanley doesn't have a pot inside. So you just pour in the stuff, right? So it would work okay for freeze drying dehydrated or things that are gonna heat up quickly. Um, and, and not, I mean, that are going to be able to be heated with hot water or boiling water. It doesn't have a pot to boil. This has a pot inside. They're actually going to bring the pot to a boil. It's more about temperature because the food's going to cook for a certain amount of time until it drops to a certain temperature. I think it's around 80 degrees Celsius, which I have to do the math for Fahrenheit. But, and I only know that because I've read it. <laughs> so I don't have it converted yet. Okay. Um, all right. So there's, does that give you an idea of the quality of insulators that we have out there? So if you increase the quality, the next one, the next slide is going to say you can increase thermal mass. Okay. And that is what happened with Mr. D's because he added, added a cast iron, cast iron ring on the bottom, which increases the thermal mass. Cause this is going to get hotter, right? This is going to get hotter. And so it's going to increase thermal mass and um, extend the amount of time that the food's gonna stay hot inside of the cooker, okay? Okay, you're welcome, Shiva. All right, let's go back to this um, sharing. All right. Oh, where's my little thing? Okay, there we go. All right, so we add thermal mass. Boiling point, when it comes to thermal cooking, it's about temperature. So we wanna know what your boiling point is, where you're located. Sea level is 212 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius. Um, at my location, it's 100 or 205 degrees, okay? Uh, if, I, if my pot loses five degrees an hour, after eight hours, what is the temperature? So, oh, how big is the Stanley? Yes, the Stanley um, is three quart. The Stanley's a three quart, so it's exactly the same. It's really close to the same as the Mr. D. All right. I didn't say it. That's why you didn't know because I hadn't said it. Okay, if your pot is 12, or if your boiling point, let's say your boiling point is a 205 degrees, and it's gonna lose five degrees an hour. Whatever cooker you choose is gonna lose five degrees an hour. After eight hours, what's the temperature? I know mine because I know mine. Um, it is gonna be 165 degrees. So if the temperature is 165 degrees after eight hours in a thermal cooker, first of all, why do we care about temperature? And it's because of food safety. Um, I like to make sure and cover this in every class because um, it's what they want me to do. I've never had problems with my food getting too cold. Obviously my oatmeal is less than 165 degrees right now, but 
it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to add bacteria right now, right? It's not going to create bacteria because it's oatmeal. I'm not going to have a problem with the oatmeal this fast. But some foods with meat in them and things that might grow bacteria in them, that's why they like to teach about food safety. So if, you're, if your food has been cold and it's warming up, it starts at 40 degrees. And if your food's hot and it's coming down, it's 140 degrees, 135, 140 degrees. So the area you want to be careful of is between 40 degrees and 140 degrees. And, um, and if you, it stays there too long, right? And so too long um, is, I don't even know how long too long is, right? Depends on what the food is. Bread, it's not going to matter at all. The oatmeal, it's not going to matter. But maybe there's other things that will grow bacteria faster. So you want to be careful with those. So I always suggest have a thermal, have a thermometer with your thermal cooker so you can check the temperature. I, like I said, I haven't had any problem with it. But if you go back after 10 hours and your food is less than 300 to 135 degrees, then you want to make sure that you get it heated up, you eat it, or you um, cool it down and put it in the refrigerator. Um, and you just want to make sure and take care of it. Don't leave it there for a whole day and then try and eat it, right? You want to be careful with that, okay? Timing, there's two times that we want to pay attention to how much time is passing with a thermal cooker. One of them is when it's boiling and one of them is while it's in the retained heat cooker, the outside part and you're just waiting, okay? So how long do you let it boil for? This is always a question I get. Most things I make, it just comes to a boil. And then I put it in the thermal cooker. This is true for freeze dried and dehydrated. This is true for grains. This is true for um, almost like um, my, anyway, in, anything that's gonna cook quickly, right? It just needs to make sure to come to a nice rolling boil unless you're gonna scorch it and then you're gonna manipulate the temperature and the time. But as long as it's thin enough that it can come to a boil, most things just need to come to a boil. When I think about how much time I have at boiling, I look, I think of the meat. So if my meat is about, can't see the picture. Okay. We'll talk about it without this picture here. So if my meat is maybe an inch thick, I like to leave it at least a four minute boil. Um, can I cook it longer? Yeah, longer doesn't matter. This is just, I'm trying to save fuel. That's why I say a four minute boil. If it's thicker, like if I cut my roast about this thick because I want to save fuel, so I cut it in the strip like chunks, that's a 10 minute boil. If I want to do a round roast, it's like a 25 minute boil, okay? Because you need to think about you're boiling the water on the outside and that heat needs to penetrate in, it needs to be hot enough that it's, continue, it's going to continue to keep that food hot and cooking to get it cooked and to make that meat tender. All right, so four, 10, 25 ish. Okay, another thing to think about the same thing about those sizes is if you're using containers. Because if you're using container cooking, it's just like if you're cooking a piece of meat, depending on the size, you want that heat to go in. So if it's about this big, I'm gonna do a good 10, 10 minutes, depending, sometimes 15, like with our mason jars. It's about a 12 minute boil on those. And it's just sort of an experimentation as far as how they do. I have some general guidelines as far as how long I like to keep them in. Um, but I'm always learning. The smaller ones are seven to 10. The bigger ones are, are you know, the, the bigger they are, it's 12 to 15. And then if they're big, big, then it's going to be 20 to 25, just like the roast. Um, then it depends on what's in the container. If I'm making a carrot cake that has a lot of moisture in it, I'm going to, I realize I, you have to, and it's in a pot, right? And it's sort of thick. It's like a 45 minute boil, 40 minute boil to get that enough heat in there to really start cooking that food. You really are almost cooking it ahead. Even though if you put it in the oven, it's going to be over an hour in the oven. So you're saving maybe a little bit of time, but because of the moisture, for some reason, something with all that like carrot cake or, or something with a lot of like fruit in it or vegetables in it, um, it's going to cook. It takes quite a bit of time where a cake mix is 20 minutes and it's done. So it's done and you put it in the insulator and then it gets done quickly. It's just lighter weight. 
and it doesn't take as much boiling time. Okay. All right. I say K so much. You know how many times I'm taking editing K out of my videos? Like constantly taking K out of my videos. It's just crazy. I should stop saying that. I don't think I can. K, K. All right. So how long do I keep it in the insulator? It depends on you. When are you going to eat? The point and the beauty of retain heat cooking is you get to decide when you're going to open it. And if you do it right and you understand the principles, you're going to make sure that you're cooking it ahead enough that you know that item needs to be done. Like with um, dry beans, you know, it needs six hours in there. So you want to do it early enough that it gets the six hours worth of time it needs in there. But most things that are just coming to a boil and you're putting them in there, you can eat them between two and eight hours. Okay. Vegetables are a little different. Like we talked about um, pasta. We already discussed those today. They're going to be different, but so many of the other things are going to just stay in there and wait for you to eat them between those times or longer. It doesn't, you know, my food was longer. Um, but uh, anyway, so leaving them in there, um, some things will be done earlier. It just sort of depends on what you need. Most of the time I'm eating between three and four hours after I put it in. That just seems to be like when I start getting ready and then when I'm, when I'm ready to eat. But it really is up to you. That's the beauty of retained heat cooking. It frees up your time to do what you want to do until you're ready to eat. Okay. All right. We made it to questions and be thinking of any questions. I'm going to go through the last two slides, which you've already seen. Here's my website, thermocooking.net. That's also where, um, like we mentioned, if you want any of the Saratoga Jack thermal cookers, you can get them there. Um, subscribe. That's also, you can subscribe to the newsletter. My email, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, if you wanted, if you're in the area and you'd like to host a class, that would be awesome. Uh, here's my YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, and Etsy. I'm trying to think of where else I'm on. I'm on a couple others, but I don't do much with them yet. And so once I do more with them, I'll let y'all know where they're at for more information. Thank you, Mary. It was very fun to have everybody here. And then again, here's my ultimate combo pack there. So let's go off of share. There we go. Let's see if you guys have any questions. Um, okay, so making the cake, question about making cake in a thermal cooker. It's exactly like what we said the bread was. You're gonna use whatever container you want. Let me show you a couple of containers with that question. And one of the things I do have on my website are containers. I'm still trying to find, um, I'll show you in a sec. Okay, so mason jars are my favorite. They're everywhere and they're cheap, right? So I will put bread in here or I'll put cake in here. If I want it to look more like a cake, I'll use this. Okay. Um, okay. If so, I'll put my bread in here. If I'm doing, okay, one of my favorite things to make, well, if I do a cake, I can put it in here, right? This is gonna be about a 20 minute boil with a cake mix. This is gonna be a 40 minute boil if it's like a heavy, heavier dense cake, um, like carrot cake. If I'm using cake mix, these are wonderful. I use, I think six of these and five of these and it works perfect. I fill them about halfway full. It'll use the whole entire cake mix and the cake is so nice and moist and, and it's, they're really good. They don't taste like a cake mix. And then you got cupcakes and kids love them. Okay. So let me go back. So um, if you want to make uh, flour, so you're going to cook some food in the bottom of this one. Let's say you want to make something here in the bottom of this one, and you want to make some kind of cornbread or something on top. Okay. The question is, can I cook the cornbread in this, right? And I've had people look about like boiling here, try and cook bread on here like cornbread. It's in, you're going to waste so much fuel trying to do that. And I don't think it'll ever work. The trick to that are these, put your cornbread in here, put five, I think five will maybe fit in there, somewhere around there, put water in here, bring this to a boil on the other, on the other burner. And you're bringing this to a boil. I'd let this boil at least seven minutes with the little jars in there. 
it, then put it in here and put it in a container. And then you've got the bread, you've got little, um, you know, cornbreads in here. That's how you're gonna have success with that. It won't work if you put the batter in here, just straight in there, it won't work. Even if you put this on the stove, it's still not gonna work because <clears throat> it's too thick and you're gonna burn the bottom, okay? I'm assuming you're talking about this one. This is my two liter bread container. Um, it says Winco, but I didn't buy it at Winco. It just must be the brand. Oh wait, Brain Marie. Yes, it is. That's exactly what it is. Brain Marie two four. Okay. And I'm picking more of these up today. I have one, somebody ordered one. And so I'll be going to get more. And so I will have all the containers in stock. Except for, I'll also swing by and check for these. I've been checking and I still don't have them in. Okay, so you know, these are for the hope sacks and other homemade ones or like coolers. These will not fit inside of a Saratoga Jack or something. These are just for the others. And for those of you that don't know, these are, um, we can, you can put these on the stove and you're doing three different meals and it creates the thermal mass to go inside of the hope sack. Right. I also want to know if people would be interested in this one. They have also the, the two, the one that's stacked for two. And I can put this on my website too. This is the 14. So it's four cups each. So it's eight cups total. And this one is a 16. So I can get this one in 14, 16, and 18. And that number just means how many cups are in each one. It's seven centimeters, but they also go with how many cups, which is great. So six cups. This is a six cup. The 16 centimeter, 16, six cup. And this is 14 centimeters, which would be two, four cups each. Okay. Um, but if you are interested in this one, let me know. And I might put these on my website because I have a huge list on waiting for these. So as soon as they come in, I will. Okay, great, Brooke. Um, I'll put these on the website. All right. Or I'll call everybody that wants them because they'll probably be sold out by then. All right, so containers, what else was I thinking? Um, oops. Will you put the slide back up for the special on the three things? Yes, I will absolutely do that. And that's available on my, my uh, thermalcooking.net homepage. It says the ultimate combo special. Um, and this is also the direct link to it, but it's probably easier just to go to thermalcooking.net homepage but that's the um, let's make sense of thermal cooking cookbook. Oh, by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, but last night I realized here all this time, since that's been up, I've been adding, I, my goal is to add extra recipes. And I thought the Mexican pinto beans was already added, but it's not. So I'll go in and put that recipe in the live version. And as I get more recipes, um, I have so many plans. I need, more. I need a personal assistant. My friend asked me yesterday if, she could hire me as her personal assistant. And I'm like, how much are you going to pay me? I don't know if I have time to be anybody's personal assistant. I need one myself. Um, so, um, and then the course, this is my 12 lesson course. And anytime I have the pertinent information, I'll, less, I'll include it into the course lessons. And then obviously the Hope Sack video step-by-step um, -step pattern is also one of the three. All right. And um, one thing on um, for those of you that read my newsletter that got my newsletter, I just sent out a couple days ago. Um, I wrote an article because I had several people last week ask me, you know, they just feel like it's such a pertinent time for thermal cooking and retained heat cooking. It's like coming of it's to its of its own. Right. It's coming of age, even though it's one of the, the oldest forms of cooking, I think. And um, so I wrote, wrote an article, you know, we're seeing the war and everything going on and we have. And I kept thinking, we've seen all these things before, but everything seems to be culminating and people are starting to go, oh, I need to really maybe learn some things about how to cook if I needed to. And one of my friends is like, Cindy, you need to figure out how to get a hold of, you know, find out how to share this information with people that are, you know, having to leave Ukraine or, or what about Germany where they're cutting off and other places in Europe where the, the um, oil, you know, the oil, they can't get it from Russia and they're, they're, they're going to have problems with with fuel and things, and even our cost of fuels like skyrocketing. So I think that this really helps in so many ways. And, but the point and what I realized as I was writing the article was, you know, I can, you know, we had 22 people on here today or something around there. 
And I can, I have, so I have a small influence of people, but the key is, is when you, it, it's you guys, let's share this information. I have so much information that people can access for free or, or do whatever. But if we can figure out how to work together to get this information out to the people that might need it, you know, that's where it goes all over the world. Sure. We have a couple of people in England. In fact, I, there's a lady just this week that she does what I do in Kenya, sort of, she does things in Kenya, like we do in Kenya. And she wants to go and teach thermal cooking. And she looked me up and or retained heat cooking. She's like, Oh my heavens, you're already done exactly what I want to learn how to do. And I'm like, well, tap in. Cause I am happy to share what information I have. So, um, Anyway, so thank you guys all for being here. And we almost went two hours today. Oops. Anyway, you know, I can talk. You guys already know that. So anyway, just uh, let me know what you need. I guess I'm like, I'll go run my errands, get my products in that I need for you. And um, sort of nice being done by 11. Oh, well, now I can go see if my grandkids want to ride with me. I don't know. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. If you don't have any other questions. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for being on, everyone. You guys are just, anyway, just keep sharing. When I do events, share them with your people so people can get in. That's really what it's about, is let's get the information out there because I can only get do so much. And I know people need this. So let's do it. And I'll have this on in a week or so. Whenever I can get this edited, I'll stick it on and I'll put it on Facebook and I'll send you all out, it out. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Awesome. Yes. I'd love to do a class. And like I, for you, those of you that want to come to any SOA-thons, we need as many hands as we can get. Oh, and you know what? We did a homeschool group yesterday. So if you're tied into any groups that you want us to come and even talk about 100 humanitarians and how to help with humanitarian work, it was an excellent presentation. If I must say so myself, it was really good. The girl, the kids, they were teenagers. They just were like, it wasn't about like necessarily what we were teaching them, but it was, they were really like getting excited about what we did, but it was like the underlying thing was how do I find what my passionate, how do I find what I want to do to help people in life? Right. And each of them, you can see their little minds going, well, not little because they half of them were taller than me, but you know what I mean? It was really, really a good experience for kids to get really feeling like, you know, they can really help in the world. So anyway, we, we also do that. So we go around and we can talk to groups of people about 100 humanitarians. So, okay. Homeschool ideas. Awesome, Brooke. Let's do that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm so glad you're on here, Brooke. I know she's going to come. She wants a thermal cooker and I think I can hook her up. Right, Brooke? Anyway, we'll talk to you later, everyone. I'm out. I'm going to start getting busy. Thanks for being on.